Uh, so how do you stay positive in a, in a negative world when you look at all the things that are going on around you? Uh, the, the negative things that you see, that you experience, they just kind of sandblast your soul. Uh, so how do you stay positive? Because if anything, David was positive. But if you look at David's life, it wasn't all positive, correct? I mean, there, there were things that sandblasted his soul as a politician, as a king, uh, as a husband, as a man. Uh, he had his issues. But for the most part of his life, as you read through the Psalter, he will share some Psalms, how he struggles through certain things. But there's always that positive pressing on for God, uh, charge the next hill kind of thing in his life. How do you maintain that attitude? Uh, well, I think you need to go back uh, and, and get back to the beginning when David pops on the scene to understand basically uh, how he has the mindset that he does in 103. Because let's go back to where he pops on the scene in the Old Testament. You see him uh, walking onto a battlefield with a slingshot, taking on a man that's nine foot, nine inches tall. What teenager would do that? None. I mean, you got to be kidding. Now, I know when you're a teenager, you think you're invincible and you can't die, correct? I know, I was a teenager. So I look back, a lot of things I used to do, I think that could have killed me. Uh, and I'm still here by God's grace, thank God. But David walks out there to take on Goliath. Um, he, he's actually nine feet, nine inches tall. He had to weigh over 400 pounds, et cetera. Uh, the scale of armor that he wore uh, and his bronze helmet weighed 125 pounds. I mean, unbelievable. Uh, he had a spear. It was a javelin. Uh, you would think you would want a light spear to be able to throw it a long way. Well, his spearhead weighed 15 pounds, just the spearhead. So you know, what, you're gonna throw it one foot? Uh, I mean, the guy is massive. So when David goes out to take on uh, Goliath, we, we get this positive image from him when he goes out to take him on because here's the first thing he hears from uh, the Philistine. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 43. The Philistine looks down at David, and I, I take all my tour groups to the Valley of Elah, and when you see this battlefield, it's not very big. There's a hill over here, there's a hill over here, and there's some farming land in between, and there's a river that's dry now going through it, and this is where this took place. It's not very big. And so we all go there, have a Bible study lesson, totally awesome to do it. Um, and he gets out there, and he sees the massive giant in front of him, and the giant roars these words, Am I a dog that you send this stick out against me? Now, we all know, why is he calling David a stick? Because when you're in high school, you're thinner. <laughs> Isn't it true? I remember when I was trying to break 180, lifting weights, drinking protein drinks and stuff like that. Finally broke 180, I was euphoric. Breaking 190 after high school or college, wasn't a problem. Got married, breaking 200 was easy. <laughs> but anyway, back to the Bible. It's too convicting. You sent this stick out to me? Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Your toast in our vernacular. How does David respond? So he's standing there. What's his weapon? Sling, slingshot. Uh, how many stones does he have? Five. He's got five stones. He's probably not going to get to the second stone. And so here's what David says. Notice the positivity of this warrior. You, Goliath, come to me with a sword? A spear and a javelin. Notice the contrast. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Your toast. He says, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have taunted, he says, this day, right now, this day, the Lord will deliver up you, uh, you up into my hands. I will strike you down. I'm going to remove your head. Whoa. He couldn't even reach up that high. Back to the text. Uh, I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and to the wild beasts of the earth. Why? This is the key part. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all of this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give it into your hands. You are mine. It's all over for you. Would you have stood before a nine foot, nine inch muscle-bound man with a weapon bigger than your body and taunted him? You know, I wrestled in high school. You know, when you, when you wrestled and they would put you on a scale, there was two scales before the match, and that's when you saw your opponent and you would go through the locker room and their team would come out and your team would come out and when you stepped on the scale, it's when you met your opponent. You, you were not nice. It was not like, hey, how you doing? How's the family? What's going on in your life? That's when you saw him and it was psychops. But you would size him up and go, I got this guy. I got a guy one time, uh, he was no stick. I was a stick. 
he was massive. You know, like some men in high school develop, the high school students look like they're 40. That type of thing. And so, so when David, you relating to some of this? You know what I'm talking about? So, so David's like, and I, I'm going to totally own you. Why? Because God is with me and you defied God. So today's the last day for you. How did he remain in a, a positive spirit in a, in a situation like that? So when most people would have imploded, David exploded. Most would have imploded in fear. He explodes in faith. How do you have that positive attitude when the world around you is throwing a Goliath or two at you? So you might be sitting here today going, yeah, I got a Goliath. Okay. Who is your Goliath? What is your Goliath? It could be external to you. It could be internal to you. But what is Goliath? So how do you maintain an attitude? Well, that is positive attitude to, to live for God. Well, he's going to tell you three things in this passage. Number one, what should you do? He said, well, first principle in the first five verses is pretty simple. Let God be blessed by your blessing. Let God be blessed by your, by your blessing. I mean, all Jews learned the, that prayer, Baruch Adonai, blessed is the Lord. You want to bless God, which means you're going to say good things to God. Now, I'm going to point out to you in this text, how many verses are there? Do you have a Bible? You don't have a Bible? This is church. You should just have a Bible. Uh, Psalm 103. Uh, so there are 22 verses, and it takes me about 10 minutes to move for, through a half a verse. So we're going to be here a while. So let God be blessed by your blessing. So notice what he says. This is a Psalm of David. That's in the Hebrew text, uh, in the superscript. It's, that's inspired. He says, uh, pay attention to how you should approach life. And he's going to say, say it three times in case you don't get it the first time. Bless the Lord, how much of you? Oh, my soul. Well, it, how much of your soul? All that is with me. I'm teaching you hermeneutics as we go along. All that is with me. What should I be doing? In case you didn't get it the first time, what should you be doing? Well, blessing his holy name. And in case you didn't get it, what should you be doing in verse two? <laughs> I should be blessing the Lord. How much of me? Oh, oh, my soul. And what should I be focused on? Well, not forgetting his benefits to me, what he's done to me. I should be living a life of blessing. So these are, as I've said before, uh, in the Hebrew text, these are not suggestions. They're commands. They're commands. They're perpetual commands. This is how you should live your life is not focusing on you, focusing on God. Not focusing on you, but focusing on God. Not one time in these 22 verses does he ask anything for himself. Try praying like this. Next time you pray, tell God, it's only gonna be about you. I'm only gonna bless you. I'm not gonna ask one thing for myself. And if you're sitting there going, well, what would what, I say to him? Well, he says, think about uh, blessing God for his benefits. So uh, if you are, are, you have tomorrow off? You're off tomorrow? Um, your assignment for tomorrow, because you came to church for an assignment, correct? <laughs> no, I came to church to relax. Not here. No, an assignment. So your t assignment tomorrow is you are sometime going to get alone with God, and you're only going to you're going to bless Him with blessings, right? That's what He says. Because when you pour out blessings to God, He pours back into your life that positive joy to press forward through the, the despondency that you're facing, Goliath. And so He says, in case you need uh, the pump primed, uh, exactly what you would bless God for, He says, let's uh, let me go through some of my big ones. He says, verse three, well, what does God do? Well, David says, let me, let me look at my life. Number one, God pardons all of your iniquities. Two, he heals all of your diseases. Three, he redeems your life from the pit. Four, he crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Five, he satisfies your years with, you, with good things so that your youth is re renewed like an eagle. Wow. He says, if you need the things to focus on, well, here's some, let me tell you. He says, um, when I want to bless God, I, I focus on the fact that he pardons how much of my iniquity? All of it, all of it. Aren't you glad? He, if he pardons all of your iniquity. Now, there's different words in Hebrew, in the Hebrew text for the word sin. Uh, this particular word uh, for uh, uh, sin, iniquity, means to twist and distort something. So if you're a man and trying to show your wife how strong you are and you got a, like a Diet Coke can and you want to crush it with one hand, it's not too impressive. Get a can from the 60s. <laughs> what were they made of? Steel. <clears throat> yeah. Think of a Diet Coke can. You're going to crush it today after lunch. You're going to go, that is an illustration, according to Marty, of the Hebrew word iniquity. What does it mean? To distort something that wasn't distorted. What is sin? It's a distortion of something that was not distorted, right? And so he says, when I think about God, I have a lot of distortion in my life, uh, and God has forgiven me of that. So what's, what, what sins would David need forgiveness for? Well, 
Well, it was the big one. Do you remember David? You never heard of David? He had a problem with, uh, what's her name? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Yeah, saw her taking a ritual bath. If you understand the topography of Israel, King's Palace was higher on the ridge just south of the, of the gates leading to the temple was his house. And then down from there were the houses of the Israelites. And she's taking a ritual bath. He can see. And we all know what happened there. I mean, that went south on him big time. Uh, I mean, he had an, a relationship with her, uh, got rid of her husband, who was one of his key warriors, lied about it, had to put him in a forward position, had him killed so he could take her. I mean, that's what sin does, right? It distorts. And so he went after somebody that wasn't his wife. He committed adultery and everything just unraveled from there. He said, God, I thank you that you're a God that forgives all of my twistedness when I come to you. Psalm 32, verse five says this, I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Notice the cause effect. I'm going to confess. Effect is you forgave, the iniqu- you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You forgave my distortion. But it didn't happen unless he did what? Confessed. And so God looks down from heaven and says, you know, I will pardon you as my child, but you got to confess first. What happens if you cover up your sin? and say, I'm not going to confess that. Well, then it eats away at you like a cancer until you know you got to come clean. So David says, when I think about blessing God, I I bless the God who pardons me. And then he throws in verse three, "I, I bless the God who heals all of our diseases. You know, when you're preaching through the Bible, it's a little more difficult than if you're just doing topically, because topically, topically, you can skip by things that are difficult. I'm just saying, talking about a pastor. You can skip stuff if you're doing topical. I was like, oh, that's too difficult to talk about. And I'm, and I'm translating my, my Hebrew text this week, and I get to this verse, I'm, I'm like, he, God heals all of your diseases. Well, I'll just pass by that one. Can I pass by it in this kind of church? Sure. <laughs> so you have to ask yourself a hermeneutical question, a Bible study question, methods. Does God heal all of your diseases? What say you? No, no. Not, not disease, because we do get disease. I mean, we do. I mean, my, I watched my dad die of brain cancer. I watched my sister uh, die of ovarian cancer three years ago. I was with Liz's twin sister when she died at 33 from breast cancer. I mean, I, I mean I've been down the road. Uh, I've, I've seen all that happen. Uh, but when you, when you look at it, it's like, okay, in, in the practical, uh, people get things. And saints get things. And like my best friend, uh, Rick, that died of uh, pancreatic cancer, had a homicide before I moved here 12 years ago. Uh, he told me one day, after I did communion with him, he said, I, I, Marty, I don't know why you guys are crying. None of us are getting out of here alive. <laughs> Rick, you're such a pragmatist. It's true. It's true. So when you look at your disease, disease and, and he says he heals all your diseases, then how do we process that? So I'll, I could do a whole sermon series on this. So I'll just give you a kind of the skinny on it. Um, you could say this is hyperbolic because we all use hyperbole. You understand hyperbole? You overstate a fact uh, to state a point. So he could be saying God is amazing. He heals. Sometimes there's exceptions because even David lost a son, did he not? Sure he did. So David knows in the practical that there are situations that God allows for his purposes that are beyond David's pay grade to totally understand. But, but he can hyperbolically say, but God is great. That if he chooses to heal, he can heal. But sometimes he uses healing uh, uh, in the lives to accomplish things. Sometimes he does not. So consider how the Bible shakes out. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 10, Paul uh, it says, three times I asked God to remove my physical malady from me. And they believe his physical malady was his eyesight was deteriorating. I, I can totally relate. Because if, if I were to take my glasses off and walk toward that screen over there, um, <laughs> I would never see it because I tried it the other day. <laughs> would you want to get in the car with me with my glasses off? And no, because I, I, I tried it. I walked all the way over there and I could not see that screen. So I can relate to Paul. God, would you take this malady away from me so I could see? And God tells him three times, no, I'm not going to do that. And what's he tell Paul in 2 Corinthians 12? My grace is sufficient for you. For when you're weak, that, that's when I'm strong for you. And so we know from 2 Corinthians 12, Paul was not healed by God because God tells him, because I've gifted you so greatly, you have such great spiritual gifts, I have to use something in your life to humble you. And that's... That's a purpose of God. But then on the other side of the the equation, we find uh, Peter shows up at the temple in Acts chapter three. 
and runs into a man who can't walk and the guy's begging for money and the beggars are still there at the temple. I see them all the time when I go there to Israel. He, he's, he can't walk and he's got, you know, alms. And what does Peter tell him? You know, uh, gold and silver, silver have I none, but because I know the risen Lord and Savior, uh, he can give you new legs. And, and the guy gets up and walks. And so God healed that man. Why? Well, he's gonna validate the ministry of Peter. So God has his purposes. So uh, the other thing ab- about healing uh, is the, the Hebrew word to heal is rafa. And that word, if you look at it lexically, at its etymological developments, its various meanings, because it has more than one nuance, uh, it can denote physical healing. It can also denote healing or, uh, of the spirit, spiritual healing. So in that sense, you could say, well, God does heal. He heals all sinners who come to him in faith. He says, I, I praise God for the fact he's healed me. Number three, God, he says, has redeemed me from the pit. Uh, the pit is just another word, the Old Testament word for Sheol or the grave. He's, David says, uh, from the Old Testament perspective, I look at uh, the grave and it, I, I know it's not the end. You have delivered me from that. He goes, I got an inkling that God is the living God, uh, that there's life beyond this. He says, you've delivered me from the pit. And when the Messiah shows up, this is exactly what he says. In John chapter 6, verse 47, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who believes that he's the Messiah and Savior has eternal life. And then Jesus says in John 6, in that passage, I am the bread of life. So when you partake of Christ by faith, metaphorically speaking, and eat of that bread, as it were, what does Jesus say you have at that precise moment? Eternal life forgiveness and eternal life. In that sense, you have defeated the pit, the grave, because God has given you eternal life. So when does eternal life start for the Christian? When you see Jesus face to face or the moment you trust Christ? The moment you trust Christ. The moment you trust Christ. This is why Paul can say in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and I've used this in many funerals for Christians, we are of good courage, I say, but as Christians, uh, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So if I die, like my friend Rick, when he died, he, he's true, we're not getting out of here alive, but he has great hope in what lies ahead because he knows to be absent from his big hulking, what was a m- massive weightlifter's body whittled down to like 90 pounds because I carried him down in a body bag to the hearse because they sent the wrong people uh, to carry bodies. And there I was that day. That was a hard day. His police officer, son-in-law, and me. And um, we carried him. He was about 90 pounds. Prior to that, he was 300 pounds. But he had great hope. Why? Because he knew that the, the pit, the grave, was not it. He had great hope in what lies ahead. And David says, I, I praise God who has redeemed me. When's the last time that you actually pause to just thank God for what lies ahead, the life that you have now? He says, uh, I, I thank God because he's crowned my life with loving kindness and compassion. Uh, he, loving kindness in Hebrew is chesed. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a guttural sounding word. Uh, and uh, that chesed means uh, loyal love that cannot be shaken. And he also gives me compassion that goes with that. So when you walk with somebody that knows God and walks with God in a positive fashion, isn't, isn't overcome by the giants of the world, there's just dripping about them this loyalty to God that you just know is there. And there's a compassion that just kind of exudes from them because they've matured in the faith. God crowns them with that. But you look at people's lives and they're crowned with bitterness, anger, depression, all these things. When God says, no, if you praise me and walk with me, I will put your, on your head uh, wonderful things like compassion for other people, uh, loyalty. He says he also should be praised because he gives you uh, good things to give you strength. And boy, does he. He gives you good things. The other day, because when I look at all my hundreds of emails that I kind of try to navigate, uh, and uh, I, I, they're all color-coded, and I have, a, I have a color code card on my monitor that tells me, because I'm getting older, to remember what I color-coded, you know, green represents this, and, you know, so I have the hang in there. So as I classify everything, then I can move through there to kind of take care of what I need to take care of. So this is for the elders, and this is for this, and this is for that. And so um, I put notes on there for people I, I, I need to shepherd more. And uh, so there was a, a lady I knew was struggling with certain things. And so I, I needed to, to reach out to her. So I re- reached out to her and, and, uh, and, and, and sent her a, a, an email from some of my readings in the morning, my, my Bible study. Uh, and I sent her this text and said, you know, I think this helps me as I face a wicked world. Perhaps this will help you. And then she wrote me, wrote me back later that day to say, that was exactly what I just studied. What are the odds of that happening? What had God done? He had taken her, facing Goliath, 
and took a verse from scripture that was sent to her to identify with the verse that she had just studied to verify to her, this is exactly how God wants you to live. That's that, that puts wind in your sails. See, so you bless God for connecting things like that. So do you? So what's your assignment for the rest of the weekend? Bless God. Bless God. You can do it in English. Don't have to do the broke out of night thing. No, you just bless, bless God and say, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down in prayer. If it's five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever, I'm just gonna bless you and thank you for all these things you've done for me. And if you, if you get stuck with what are they, he just gave you several at the kind of prime the pump. Number two, what should you do? He said, you should let your past, in verses uh, six to 18, you should let your past empower your present. You should let your past, what God's done in your life, empower the present situation with Goliath. It's, notice what he says, verse 34 of 1 Samuel 17. David uses the same, same technique. It's like arguing from the lesser to the greater. If God did this for me back in 1967, 1972, 1995, you know, if he did these things for me, I need to remember those and use them when I get over here and I'm facing Goliath later for strength, to be positive. So this is what he's gonna say in 1 Samuel 17. When he talks to Saul, listen to his language as a high school student. But David said to Saul, this is before he took on Goliath, your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion and a bear, because Saul saying, why should I send you out there? He said, well, I was tending the sheep when a lion and a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. And I went out after him. <laughs> you did what? You ran out after a bear? What do most people do if they see a bear? Opposite direction. Yeah, I had two friends that were fishing in California, trout fishing, caught a bunch of fish, had them on a stringer. They were walking back, you know, to the car. A bear saw them. He wants the goodies. Starts running after him. My friends got all the, you know, the trout hanging, on, you know, dangling on all these, you know. And the one friend just left the other guy behind. <laughs> he did. And he's screaming at the guy. The bear's closing in on him. And he's telling him, drop the trout. He's screaming, you know how long it took to get this? Anyway, so most people, anyway, I'm, it's too convicting. Moving back to the text. So he says, uh, I went after him and I attacked him and I rescued him it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Are you kidding me? Have you seen a lion at the zoo? I mean, have you? Have you not? I have many times. And they're just kind of sitting there calmly. And you look at the size of their paw and you're thinking, that paw is bigger than my face. Who in their right mind, if the, if the lion had one of your little lambs and you've got another 99 of them, would go, I'm getting it back. I'm grabbing his beard. Who? Yeah, I got 99. I'm good. No, I, I, I grabbed and I killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear and he's this uncircumcised Philistine. He's going to be like one of them since he taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the, ha the hand of the Philistine. Arguing from the lesser to the greater. If God allowed me to save a little lamb from a bear and a lion, what's a 400 pound Philistine? You see the argumentation? Would you say that's positive? At my last church, we went on a camp out near Lake Tahoe to a place called Bear River Reservoir. What did I just say? bear. Why did they name it that? Yeah. So we get up there, we set up all the tents for all the church and they're all over the hillside and, and it was totally cool. And I had a high school, no, it was a college student walked up to me and she's got tattoos and everything. She walks up to me. She said, Hey pastor, you know, she's kind of a gangster kind of girl. And so I was just kind of wondering, cause she, she didn't go camping. You could tell. She said, why did they name this place? Bear River Reservoir? I go, honey, if they named it Squirrel River, oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> she goes, you mean there's bears here? Mm -hmm. Squirrels too. Yeah. <laughs> well, so we're sitting there one night and, and we built a huge bonfire for the church and we're doing the s'mores thing. Aren't those great? And uh, we're having a great time and the fire dies down. It's about 1, 1 in the morning. Uh, and so we're all peeling off to our you know, little tents and there's a police officer with us, with his family. And he has his th service revolver, his nine millimeter with him. Yeah, okay, take note of that. He peels off with his wife, goes into his tent up the hill, zips the tent closed. And so everybody's sitting there, you know, talking, fire's dying down. And, and finally, there was one college student left there by himself. He's just sitting there chilling, looking at the fire, the embers, thought he heard something, looked to his left, didn't see anything, looked to his right, and there was a snout of a bear right there. 
I can tell you what he didn't do. He did not grab the beard of the bear. He did not. I heard the commotion and the screaming of that skinny little stick of hot college student running through the camp. It was embarrassing. He runs into the police officer's tent in the middle of the night, two in the morning, unzips it, runs in, zips it back. <laughs> the cop wakes up. He says, what are you doing in my tent? He says, there's a bear out there. He goes, get out of my tent. <laughs> anyway, back to the text. I submit to you, David is totally brave, is he not? See, you need to look at your Goliath and go, I'm not running from this. Why? Well, because God's with me. So he says, man, let me remember back to the times of blessing when God blessed, and I'm going to extrapolate to the present to get total strength from that. So he's going to go through three things. So if you look back and you go, well, I can't remember anything in my life God doing that was just like miraculous. Well, start where he starts. He starts with Moses and he says, well, I can remember back from what I've been told by my parents and what I learned in, 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 in uh, you know, at the synagogue, etc. I've learned that God did some amazing things at the Exodus. Notice verse six, the Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. That's the Israelites in captivity. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. Boy, did he. It says the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He said, I've read the, I've read the Torah. And it has taught me that, that God in the times of Moses with the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years, he was compassionate to them, gracious to them, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. Yeah, I've seen all of that about God. And, and I, he said, I've seen God do some amazing things to free the Israelites from their captivity, like wipe out the entire uh, Egyptian pantheon when he, when he brought all the, all the plagues. I mean, you would think if the old 80-something-year-old guy walks down with a wooden stick, sticks it in the Nile, and it's instant blood, you would be thinking as an Israelite, yes! God is powerful, because that's not normal, right? He says, yeah, God is so great. I remember how great he is. And he says, I remember the past victories of God, and I extrapolate those to the present to say, if that God can do that for old man Moses and the Israelites, then what can he do in my life? Remember Moses comes down from the mount with the tablets? What would you want, not want to do with tablets that were written on by the finger of God? Drop them right? What'd he do? He walks down from the mountain. He sees the Israelites partying around the golden calf. He breaks them. He breaks them. What does God do later? God shows great grace in Exodus chapter 34 verses 1 to 2. He makes new ones. Awesome. So he says, I look back at the great things that God has done, and I take those miracles, and I extrapolate for those, from those, and I apply them to the present. Do you? Or you, do you tend to forget the things that God has done? Remember the other Sunday when my best friend from high school showed up here unannounced to me? Hubert blew me away. And as they're trying to rush me off the stage, I'm trying to talk to people. They're trying to rush me off the stage. What's the problem? And they get me out here into the foyer. And I hadn't seen Hubie since 1976. And I told you he had changed. I had not. And, <laughs> and, but, but Hubert was passing through town and I hadn't seen him in all those years, and he just wanted to say hi, and he wanted to tell me thank you for sharing Christ with me and leading, leading me to Christ when we were kids in high school. Because when he joined the Navy and became a corpsman in San Diego, I went to college in L.A., and there was that one Friday night, I drove about four hours home to El Centro in the desert, and he drove home unbeknownst to me to see his parents as a Navy corpsman, and we both, without knowing it, both went to the high school football game to see friends, and we both found each other, he didn't have a car. I had a car. After the game was when I went to his mom and dad's house and led him to Christ in the parking lot. After all those years, I still get chills thinking about it. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that we ran into each other. So next time you hit a tough spot, you look back and go, man, God did that. And if God can do that miraculous thing and save somebody and free them from bondage, man, what else can he do? He also says in verses 9 to 12, uh, remember that when God is, uh, God is tender when you, when you trip up, not if you trip up. You will sin today. You understand this, correct? <laughs> yeah. You will probably sin leaving the parking lot. Somehow, <laughs> something's going to happen. Okay? All right? You just let another Christian get in front of your car when you thought it was God's will predestined for you to get in front of them, and all of a sudden, you have sinned. Okay? <laughs> just look at yourself and go, Marty said this would happen. Okay? So he says, when you sin, remember that God is tender. Aren't you glad God is tender? 
Notice what he says. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Has he not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness, there's that word chesed again, toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. He says, when you think about how God is so great, he's tender to you when you blow it. He says, I thank God all the time. I remember when he's forgiven me. So if God were to judge you and treat you based upon his holiness and your lifestyle, would you see tomorrow to cook out? No, no, no. Remember the other night we had that huge uh, electrical storm that rolled through here, totally awesome. I love, like, I love to watch lightning. Uh, and I went outside to experience it. Cause it was like blowing up my neighborhood. I just want to feel the power of God. And I went out, <laughs> I'm smart to a point. And I, I, went, I went out on the front porch. And I'm like, man, this is awesome how great God is. I thought that for about five seconds until a bolt hit near my home. And then I quickly went back inside uh, because I am a logical person and realized God could take me out. Um, but you know, if, 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 if God treated us according to his holiness and how we walk on a given day, there would just be constant lightning bolts. Oh, they're gone. Oh, they're gone. Oh, they're, they're, they're gone. Because he would not be tender. He would take you out. And he says, God, I am so glad that you don't reward us according to our iniquities, our twistedness. You, you forgive us. You pardon us. So when you are looking at the times when, when God has taken you when you've sinned and you've come back and forgive, asked for forgiveness and, and, and repented before him and he forgave you, uh, that is what you extrapolate from into the present situation with your Goliath to say, God, wow, thank you that you treat me with grace. Aren't you glad? If this was a Pentecostal church, everybody would be saying amen. amen. <laughs> I wasn't telling you to, just think it. <laughs> We're an abstract church. Um, third thing, he says, God remembers us that we are finite, frail creatures, doesn't he? He knows, what are we made out of? Dust, dust. See, he knew that Moses had issues when it came to speech, didn't he? He picks, a, he picks an old man who has stuttering problems to be the leader of the nation. Can you imagine? I'm gonna, you're gonna be the main spokesman to the entire nation and that's what I want you to do. And he's like stuttering through telling God no. God used him anyway. See, God uses things that aren't perfect vessels. Uh, when Elijah uh, was going to be the great one to take on uh, the prophets of Baal, and when we go to Israel on day two, we go to Mount Carmel and walk to the Carmelite mission and go see the Valley of Jezreel, Armageddon, uh, where, Mo, uh, where Elijah took on the prophets of Baal. It was awesome. But then we also know he, after that event, he ran from Jezebel. I mean, down into the Sinai to hide from her. And, and God knew in his, in his providence and his omniscience that Elijah was going to bite the dust when it came to Jezebel. But he used them anyway, didn't he? I mean, you can go down through the list. Uh, Peter, uh, was he a perfect man? No. He had issues, didn't he? He tended to be like the bull in the china shop. He's the guy who would act first and then think later. Uh, James and John, they were named sons of thunder. Why? Because they needed anger management classes. <laughs> There are two disciples. And God says, I'm taking all these dysfunctional, broken people and I'm gonna use them because I know they're frail creatures, but I can do great things in and through them. This is what David says here. Frailty. He says, just as a father has compassion on his children, true, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He's mindful that we are what? Dust. We're just dust. As for man, his days are like grass, a flower in the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it's no more, it, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But notice the contrast. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting for those who fear him, and his righteousness to the children's children, to those who keep his covenant and who remember his precepts to do them. Heavy on to those who fear him. If you're a child of God shaking your fist in God's face and thinking God's gonna bless your life, as one young lady I was counseling this week uh, hasn't got a clue, but who's involved in sexual sin, and I'm telling her, you need to come clean, and she's not coming clean. I told her, God will not bless you. He will only bless you if you move away from sin. But how often do we, we're frail, and we, and we bite the spiritual dust. But he says, if you fear me and you walk with me, you will, you, I will pour my compassion all over you because I understand how frail you are. You're frail. Uh, my favorite uh, flower in my yard this time of year is, uh, are, are the peony 
Uh, I didn't grow them in California. They didn't grow very well there. I didn't know what they were when they first came here. I'm like, whoa, what is that? So now I have bulbs all over my yard. Uh, and I love it when they start coming up and they start forming those little bud nodules and they're gonna explode. You know what I'm talking about? You feel my joy? And then they explode. And then my wife cuts them all and <laughs> puts them in the house. She loves to have the beauty inside the house. And um, I was cutting the, the deadheading the other day and I'm thinking to myself as I'm cutting them, this is my life. It comes up. It's powerful for a moment. It's enjoyable. But it's like a flower. And it fades. And there comes the time when it's, it's done. And I am so glad that God understands that I'm like that flower. Uh, I'm frail. I'm frail. And that, because he understands that we're frail, he, he's then gracious and patient with us in our frailty. Aren't you glad? He says, think about when God is forgiving your frailty extrapolate to the present and get great strength from that. Lastly, he closes uh, with a, a concept uh, which is most amazing. Um, from a rhetorical structure in the Hebrew text, we would call this inclusio. Inclusio? Inclusio means how you started is how you ended. How you started is how you ended. So it, it's a, a Hebraic uh, device to tie a bow around what was just said. Well, what's the bow? Well, the bow has everything to do with blessing. And I would summarize verses 19 to 22 this way. Let God's reign be, it's a play on words, be your reign. Why? Because if you're struggling with Goliath, uh, it, these negative things, it can suck the life out of you. It can, it can take the, your life and so suck the life and the joy out of you. Your life is like broken, dry dirt that's not fertile anymore when you're dealing with Goliath. And David closes this out to say, well, how do, you, how do you battle that? Well, you want God's reign that he rules to be poured all over your life. Because when I understand that he's on his throne, then no matter what Goliath I faith, face, it's going to be okay. Why? Because he's with me. Notice what he says. The Lord has established his throne where? It's in the heavens. It's in the heavens. And his sovereignty rules over, well, some people. All. All believers and unbelievers. Everybody, every general, every admiral, every politician, every school teacher, every banker, every investment broker, all. He rules over them. So if I understand that God's reign in the heavenlies is over all, then if he's over all and sovereignly all powerful, then I can look at my life and think, I'm, I, need to, I need to live differently when I'm thinking about him. So in light of what he says there, notice who he says should bless God. Two verses. He says, bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength to perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Verse 21 is for angels. Bless the Lord, all you host. Shavot is the Hebrew word for army, angelic army. You who serve him doing his will. Imagine what an angel sees on a daily basis. And there's no time where God is, but 24 seven. Imagine what they see. They see God on his throne, almighty God and all of his power on his throne. They got it. And, and, and what did they do? Well, when you get glimpses into the heavenly sphere like Isaiah 6, when Isaiah is transported in the presence of God into the throne room of God and he sees the seraphim before God's throne, what are they chanting constantly? Three words. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, holy, kadosh. Kadosh, he's separated from that which is evil. When you get to Revelation chapter four and John is transported uh, by God from uh, Patmos, the island where he's uh, banished by Domitian uh, to heaven and he gets to stand in the courtroom of God before the tribulation begins. He runs into the angelic class again, gathered around the throne of God. Well, they're worshiping and, and praising God. And so David says, when you think about the reign of God, his rulership, it should leave ipso facto to blessing coming out of your life. So he said, angels should be doing this, and they are. And then he says in verse 22, well, since the angels are doing it, well, that's what we should do. In verse 22, he says, bless the Lord, all you his works, all of his works, in all the places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. See the inclusio? Started there, he ends there, so what should you be doing? Well, you have an assignment. What's your assignment? Get alone with God and say, God, in the next few moments, I'm not gonna ask you for one thing. That's what I usually do. No, I'm only gonna stop and I'm gonna thank you for what you've done in my life and I'm gonna start naming them. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my children. Thank you for adversity that you've sent my way. That's honed the soul. I mean, go. I mean, I've done this. And many times. And if you think you have, haven't much to say, you will be shocked. 
because your heart will open and out will come lots of things to bless God for. That's your assignment. And then you might throw in there, and God, could you occasionally remind me of the great things you've done in my life so that I can look at Goliath in my day and not fear? And oh, by the way, while you're doing that, God, could you help me to understand on a daily basis that no matter what happens in my culture, in my country, that you're on a throne and all are accountable to you, but you're my father and I'm gonna see you face to face. Help me to remember who you are and bless you because of how great you are. Talk about living a positive life in a godless world. That's how you do it. Hope you have a great, uh, great rest of the day. Pray that it gets sunny for me for tomorrow. It's always raining on my day offs. I can't, I don't know if it's God or the devil. I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> Hope you have a great day tomorrow uh, with the family. And we do thank all of those who sacrifice much uh, for us to be in such a great country. I'm humbled. Uh, every time I go to Arlington, do a, a service there, I always go early to walk around and thank God for where I live. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Uh, we, we do thank you for being holy, but also being like a father that you do have compassion on us for we are weak and frail. We do trip up, we do fall, uh, but you just like a good father are there waiting for us to come and confess so you can restore us and empower us for greater living. And we pray for those uh, who don't know you today that uh, your spirit would draw them unto yourself. And this would be the day they would say, God, take my sin as you said and remove it as far as the east is from the west and you'll do it in Christ's name, amen.